Thinking Class, Matt. Hi, lovely to join you. Thanks for having me, John. You're very happy to have you too. Uh, we, we put this in a diary a little while ago through our mutual friend, Tom Hancock. Uh, so I've been looking forward to this one. And uh, my partner, she's also said she's been looking forward to this one. So let's not disappoint. No, no pressure there then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I like to lay things on thick nice and soon. Um, you work in academia and business schools, and we're here to talk about epistemic humility, which now I find myself saying it doesn't sound uh, too too humble in itself. Um, as someone who's a business school director of culture and values and an academic and a consultant, uh, I know you'll have lots to say on this, having written papers on it. So let's begin from the top. What is epistemic humility in plain English? That's a good question. And uh, as academics, we do like to make things sound more complicated than they probably need to be. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, epistemic humility, so I struggle with this as well, um, is really just that recognition um, that we've got limitations to our own knowledge, our capabilities, our experiences, um, being humble around that. So understanding what that might mean um, and having a curiosity to, un curiosity to understand what we don't know, what other people might know, um, and to think through what the implications of that are. That's wonderful. I'm glad to hear there is someone within academia and someone who is bridging across into the corporate world uh, into e encouraging epistemic humility. Uh, what made you think that, I suppose, epistemic hubris was a problem and why do you want to do something about it? Uh, well, that's um, I, I can't take credit to this. So I think uh, my, my colleague, Divya uh, Singhal, who's at the Goering Institute of Management, and uh, colleague Kimbrick Voss, who's down at Bristol um, University. This has come through conversations we've had over the past few years um, around some of the issues I guess we see with uh, our, our students coming through business schools um, and maybe some of the mindsets that we help encourage, uh, I think, through the way that we teach, but also some of the issues we see, I think, in practice when we look at how businesses behave, some of the decisions which are being made um, that maybe in the short term, or they're a bit insular. Um, so that kind of spurred us to think, well, what, what's going on here? Um, and what's the kind of mindset actually that starts to change the decisions that particularly leaders take? Um, and for us, kind of teaching, working within business schools, the leaders of the future. So what can we do to help maybe broaden the perspectives of um, our business school students, the people who want to be uh, the titans of industry in, uh, in, in 20 years time, who are grappling with this huge range of uh, problems and challenges that are coming through. Now, how do we help equip them to have the, what we'd say, the humility to, to be curious to find out who else can help them fix those problems rather than being maybe overconfident and thinking they automatically have the answers or the best knowledge or tools to fix those things? Yeah, well, that certainly resonates with my experience in the corporate world where I suppose for those people who are inducted into it straight out of some kind of a, a red brick university, which has a very specific way of thinking and doing and um, matriculating people um, into this abstract logical way of thinking that's focused on scheduling, planning, rationalisms, you know, everything's under our control, as it were. Um, but for those people who come out and, um, you know, straight into a, a graduate program um, and they've only ever known what it feels like to sit in a, inside a glass and steel air conditioned building and um, in, in a nice whitewashed office that isn't a very representative way of the way the world works and uh, something was unveiled to me I think about this um, this this corporate mindset in recent years when I read a book by Ian McGilchrist called The Master and His Emissary I don't know if you've ever come across it before He's famous for the hemisphere hypothesis, which um, is often mischaracterized as uh, this kind of left being very rational, right being very emotional kind of a brain. But effectively, what he argues in that is that the division of the human brain is essential to human existence. It makes possible incompatible versions of the world. And both sides of the hemispheres have different priorities and values. And what, what he tells us is that the left hemisphere enables narrow focus that deals in logic and abstraction, it helps us to bring targets under control. And it says that its relationship with the world is one that's reaching out to grasp to use it. So it has that idea of seeing things in usefulness and productivity, 
Whereas the right hemisphere is one of reaching out without purpose and helps us to intuit reality. It can see the connections between things, see see and sense the whole and, and within its context, uh, instead of breaking things down and, and abstracted from the context, which to me is what the corporate mindset is, right? It's like, let's get really focused on data and data sets for their own sake. And we just want lots of different reporting measures. And if we just get these measures and metrics met, then we can mark that as success. But we often don't see through that tendency to, I don't know, a technocratic governance, as it were, you know, a rule by technical experts on something, this business school thinking that we're applying uniform policy across you know, a wide range of geographies and cultures, and it kind of divorces values from facts. Does, that, does any of that resonate with you at all? It does. I, I, I don't see, um, I guess, see the narrow technical and the the inquisitive link making is, is mutually exclusive. I think the they feed in and feed off each other, I think, in terms of understanding where we need to go deep, I guess, and where the expertise is needed. Um, but then being curious to understand, well, how do I start to put those together to, um, yeah, make it kind of address a bigger picture or to, to kind of, and I'm, I'm a fan of systems thinking and social technical systems thinking and the idea that we need to bring this knowledge and this collection of knowledge together and expertise. And that's the only way really of, of I think, solving some of the, the wicked problems. And I think that that mindset thing, it, it's, it's not losing one or, or denigrating either, either either of those. I think it's looking at how we get them to work um, together. I think more effectively. But I think that. But but I think that's where um, you talk about the red brick mentality, maybe the traditional academic model, and we we do encourage people to go deep and to specialise in a discipline. And I think even in um, I guess more applied subjects in in management and elsewhere, you might be drawing across different disciplinary backgrounds. Um, we still examine uh, and test often in a narrow way um, that gets you to think about a particular knowledge set of theories, uh, tools and so on to apply to a problem. We break these things down. So I absolutely agree it. Um, and I also think there's something, actually think about the physical um, aspect of universities as well. The, often the, um, the business school will be in a very nice building, typically. Um, and we're often uh, kind of maybe a part on campus or it's a little bit different. I think we, we, we encourage this kind of idea of exceptionalism and, and being apart from others um, and others maybe within our universities as well, um, just by, by things around the, the way we try to um, uh, build or, or encourage kind of a corporate environment to help them think about what it would be like when they go out into the corporate world. And actually some of that puts up barriers Actually, even in terms of just, I think, kind of very collaborating more, kind of interacting more with, with students in, in other areas of the university that you can gain so much from, I think, when you're exposed to those different ideas. Hmm. Absolutely. I think we've touched on some already, but what are the negative impacts or, or some of them, at least, that you, that you see in the real world that are downstream from, from the business school thinking that, that you're seeing the need to transform? Yeah. Um, oh, where to start then? Uh <laughs> So um, I, I think um, maybe one of the one of the things that probably is just the the assumption that we can fix problems on our own. So I think when you look at and I always think um, sustainability is a really nice place to to start with this. Um, and if you read often kind of corporate uh, sustainability or CSR reports, and we've got lots of grand plans and agendas about how we're going to address sustainable development goals and, and big, bold claims often that come with that. And so much of this is individual firms' actions. So acting in isolation, it might be thinking about um, single product or services and, and how they're going to have an effect. Um, and we miss the opportunity, I think, to, to look at that collaborative action and where we need to draw upon, let's say, other businesses within our, our peer networks and so on as well. Um, but also, I think, in terms of kind of assuming that we have knowledge within our disciplines and technical areas as well, that we can engineer our way out of some of the problems we see. So we can try and make products and, and uh, services, just make them a bit more efficient. Um, and that's what we're, we're going to need to do, rather than thinking actually, what can we learn from maybe other societies, other cultures who you know, maybe approach it in a completely different way. They don't use this product. They've never had this product. And actually, they're still able to live in particularly kind of satisfying ways. What is it they do that we could learn from? What are the, the knowledge and the expertise um, that they have? 
or where there's societies where, again, kind of maybe financially they're not able, able to to access the same services, they found other creative ways to um, to deliver. And again, I think learning from that and, and being open to learning. Um, so that's a slightly rambling um, kind of answer on this, but it, but I think we at the heart of this, I think we when you look in 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 terms of um, the business environment, so often. Um, we assume we know how to fix something. So either that's kind of through our own knowledge and, and kind of the expertise we have in-house, or we're kind of overconfident at our own decision-making, or we think we can buy this this expertise in. So there's others like us, so I know I know where to go and get my consulting advice from. These people, they have the answers. Um, and I think that's there's a bit of arrogance there in terms of assuming not only the we have the answers if that's the case, but also we know the knowledge that we're missing. So we know where to go looking for this. And um, I think this is where kind of the, the need for, for being curious, for being kind of open to challenging our own views really comes in because you, you don't know what you don't know until you're confronted with it, until you've seen other realities, other ways of doing things. And, um, you know, I think this, this kind of, um, you mentioned the graduate schemes and the, kind of going into corporate roles um, we're good at kind of uh, getting people into that system quite quickly and teaching them how things are done and the norms and, and so on. Um, and I think that that's really dangerous because it, it's kind of walling us off from other members of societies, other areas where we could be learning from. Mm. So, so you, I suppose in this respect, you're talking about exposing people to different perspectives and environments to foster that um what's the word that sensibility to yeah. other ways of, of doing and seeing um well because i get I think about it because so, um, I, I guess this is if we don't do that that we make assumptions i think we make lazy assumptions about let's say what other people need we, we wouldn't do that i think in terms of marketing doing product um product testing or market research we go out and we actively look for other people's views and, and experience to understand um what they might need I think there's a similar thing when we're looking good, um, bigger challenges. So we, we're particularly thinking around some of the global challenges that we, we face that, that are really, really kind of difficult to, to grapple with and beyond the means of individual firms, disciplines, countries even to, to do so. Um, and I think that there's, there's a danger of not, not questioning kind of who has the, the knowledge that's necessary and how we go about this. And I think if we can continue to, to kind of um uh kind of keep this as a closed conversation so it's it's within our industry or it's within our discipline or it's kind of you know the the corporate leaders within this you know whatever the club is that we're, we're looking at then we're missing out i think on the the kind of the ideas the radicalness that comes from other other areas if that makes sense it does make sense i wonder whether there's a political philosophy angle to chuck in here as well and for fear of potentially derailing this into some kind of wider political discussion is you know, it's frequently reported the, the imbalance within universities about those who uh, possess a kind of, how would you term it? Well, there are various terms, an urban progressive or a left liberal uh, mindset, as it were. Uh, I think it's something like the number of academics that hold that mindset outnumber those with a small c conservative uh, outlook on the world nine to one. Um, but that urban progressive mindset, the left liberal one is held by only about 20% of the population. And when you look at probably civil service, um, major consulting firms, financial services, a lot of corporations, pretty much anyone with their hands on the, the, the levers of society, um, they're probably very heavily dominated by in a similar ratio, actually, of that nine to one, um, even if most of society do doesn't see the world that way. And uh, and I think, and, and I'd be interested to hear what you think of this. Um, but I think what we're, what seems to be missing here is a sense or at least a recognition that that other worldview is something which is natural in some ways and needs to be taken into account. And, and is often not, and that we're in such a giant echo chamber that we get really surprised when 
things like Brexit happen or Hertha Wilders comes in and the Netherlands, even though, you know, if anyone had bothered to look, they would see that a lot of this is just blowback to the kinds of policies that have been dreamt up in these environments. And if they had a wider way of seeing, then perhaps there wouldn't have been the blowback in the first place. So I wonder what, I wonder what, you know, not just academic institutions, but corporations can be doing to take this stuff into account. Yeah. Um, so we don't end up in the situation where there's a, a polarized world. Yeah, ab- absolutely agree. And I think it's an issue. Um, and that, that whether you, you call it bias or overrepresentation, I guess, of a particular views and experiences, um, because it colors how people uh, approach decision making and 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 where they put resources all those kind of things I absolutely agree um so i, I think the the heart I, I don't have it i don't necessarily have a problem with there being an over representation of, of, of particular views that you know we can argue about where where that comes from what drives that i think as long as the the opportunity to participate and to join whether it's an institution or an organization is open you you're trying to um, be as diverse as you can do. If you end up with a particular um, bias, and I think you know that that's what you have. You work with it. You you just need to be aware of that, and aware of what the implications then might be. And I think for me, then that comes down to something in terms of actually empathy. And I think that's one of the things that concerns me when you have a particular group who's overrepresented or a particular mindset, is whether that makes it more difficult to to empathise with people who have a, a, a divergent view. So I think the Brexit is a really good example of that in terms of people almost stopping listening, I think, um, and denigrating people with the opposite view on, on both sides of this. Um, but I think there's a similar thing more generally then in, in terms of whether it's business or, or wider society around um, the value of, of empathy. And for me, that links in with this idea of epistemic humility, understanding that we, we don't have all the answers. We're not omnipotent. We're not... Um, people who can fix everything on our own, um, and there's a limit to our our ability and what we can do. Um, and I think that that then can go hand in hand with with empathy as well, and, and understanding why other people maybe have different views, different world experiences, um, and that triggering triggering interest as well. But I think you have to care about other people and other people's experiences to then want to do something about acting on their knowledge or valuing their experiences. Um, as well, and that's if we think about it, um, there's an aspect here, I guess, in terms of why why is this important? Why why would we go to the effort of trying to get people to encounter others, encounter other worldviews? Because um, that can be uncomfortable. It can challenge. It can be really uncomfortable actually to see that things we've always thought to be correct or, or things we think are really important or ways to do things actually other people may not value or may have a very different they contribute, that can be really uncomfortable psychologically, um, but there's value in it. Um, and I think on the business side, some of that is is if you don't have the, the curiosity to learn about others, if you're not concerned about the the views of maybe local communities or, or others affected by your products or services, then that's a real risk. Um, so I know before the uh, before our discussion, John, you mentioned the, the question around kind of that license to operate, social license, um, that firms have, and that's kind of that acceptance by uh, communities and, and local uh, local people for what you do as a business. Um, and I think it's really difficult to keep that that buy-in for people to think that you're responsible, that we trust you to to operate here, that we'll buy your product, if they don't feel that you're interested in them as well and you respect them um, and value them. And I think all of that is tied up in terms of this this humility, this empathy. Um, that we're talking about. Hmm. That's a really interesting point, Matt. We talked a, a bit about the global problems, international view of things, and I wonder if somehow that can contribute to uh, epistemic hubris in some way, um, or at least blind people to um, a more local national view of things. So. <clears throat> Commonly in my experience, you can you, you come across quite a few people in your, your working life who want to make impact and they want to make impact at a, a global scale, which is always from a good place for sure. Um, 
But I think what's quite interesting is that uh, um, there seems to have been a shift with how um, I suppose people are inculcated into um, the working world through their academic studies and everyone comes out with an international mindset. And it was brought home to me by, and I know I shouldn't take this as a um, as 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 something for to, for red, but um, I don't uh, I don't often watch the, the television. Um, but when my partner succeeds in getting me to watch something, it's always on something based on history or something remotely documentary like. So we watched Chariots Fire on the weekend, and um, for those listening who have not seen it. Um, it's a film about um, two runners, one uh, an, an English Jew called um, Harold Abrahams and another one a Scottish Christian called Eric Liddell from um, Scotland, both of whom go to r- r- race for, for Great, Great Britain. Um, but anyway, um, Harold Abrahams ends up going to the University of Cambridge and it is presented as a bit of a snooty place at times, but it's also presented... Um, as one that is extraordinarily proud of its tradition. And um, when he's speaking to the masters of his college, they say that their job is not just for him to walk away with a degree, but to help create an Englishman and to give a certain sense of um, what the culture is, to inculcate him with virtues and civility and manners so that he can operate within the society that he finds himself in. And, And he just so happens to be the son of a Lithuanian Jew um, who basically said, I'm raising an Englishman. I need you to know what it's like to to be amongst the people here. Um, and I wonder if there's a sense of this having been lost in, in some respects that we can get so focused on the international view of things and we can all be very comfortable amongst other internationally minded people, but we come to um, forget almost the, the country in which that we do business in. What do you make of that? Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I've not thought about it in that way. So give me one moment to to process, I guess, as well. So there's probably a couple of things in that. So I guess we would try and unpack this a little bit. So I, I, I guess I, I take maybe a little bit of issue around what type of internationalization we're achieving. So I think if we absolutely the, the value, and I think I find it amazing walking around my campus, other university campuses, and the the sheer um, international diversity, cultural diversity um, that there is on campus. Um, But I think it's difficult to argue, particularly if we're talking about um, elite international universities that draw the really wide, really large numbers of global uh, students, that that is necessarily giving local students a a real insight into the diversity of culture. Um, that you might have if you went and experienced the, the home nation that a particular student is from. So typically people have to be in the elite of those countries to, to make the grade, I guess, and to have the resources to, to travel. So I guess it's a narrow view into um, other international contexts. Um, so the, uh, I guess that's, that's one point. Um, the second then I think as well is, I guess the... Um, you mentioned that um, the kind of the university is trying to to uh, produce a particular type of uh, a person at the end, set of values, and so on. And I guess that that I think still resonates. So I think each university, particularly here in the UK, has I think quite a clear idea of the type of student they'd like to to help form uh, whilst they have them on campus. So um, particular values the university leads. We've got our four core values. Others will have variations on those and, and the general, I guess, held academic values we we kind of uh, proffer. Um, but whether whether they reflect the local challenges, I guess, is is a question. So is that the right level? Um, I guess we've got to push to be thinking about global challenges, so sustainable development goals. Um, I guess research funders have particular international challenges they often talk about as well. We look at the bigger picture, we're trying to find things that cut across maybe our student groups as well that that everybody can identify with. So I guess there is a a danger that you lose some of that local connection. I know in Leeds we pride ourselves on being a civic university um, and think about the the city and local challenges. I know other institutions 
are similar and, and look at partnerships with local um, social enterprises and local government and others to to try and localize whether that interaction and whether that feeds through to the wider student body um, it may not be as as widespread so yeah potentially um so this thinking through in terms of where we are but i guess we the danger is that you you look to to find the the causes and the issues that cut across an increasingly diverse and global audience and and that does step you up against you're looking at issues that, that everybody can relate to and that may not be you know the the, the most pressing local concerns of, of, of the local community but i think that that need to be more cognizant to the to the local community is not new um maybe our awareness has grown i, I don't know mm. Well, one to one to chew on. Mm. What what other what other environments or perspectives do you think that we should expose students to 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 foster that sense of humility? Well, I think as it, wide a range of um, environments and people as we can do, really. To be honest, I think universities are working really hard to broaden our student demographic to reach under represented groups in society and that's really valuable it increases the diversity within the student body and that has um you know numerous benefits in terms of actually the experiences the insights that it, it exposes other groups to and we can talk about privilege and relative privilege and and where people come from and i think the more diverse the student body is then the greater opportunity that people actually come into contact with that in a natural day-to-day -day, um, environment and i think that cuts both you know always really in terms of the benefits of this but I think, and you touched on this with the um, the example you gave with uh, Chariots of Fire, um, we do try to to build a, a mindset and a, and a um, obviously the academic model and, and what we expect. And I think the the universities we for all these kind of symbols and artifacts that, that kind of prompt particular kind of ways of doing things, the culture that exists within institutions, and I think particularly within business schools, um, again, that push to try and help prepare students for corporate life. Um, I think there's a, a push to help to think about large corporates in particular and the types of environments they might walk into. Um, and we try to treat them in, in that way, give them the experience of what might it be like. We encourage years in industry and uh, sandwich courses, those kind of things for people to get work experience. Um, again, to help them think about traditional work environments. And I think a lot of that keeps them within a, a particular a particular group, I guess, um, as well, in terms of people who are in business who are being successful within that world as well. Um, so the more we can do, I think, to bring people from outside of that in, so often it's really difficult to access um, university campuses. Um, they're open, but they can be quite intimidating places, I think. Um, we often you know, might run events which are open to the public, but how inclusive those are, how wide the invitations go out, whether if you're somebody who's never kind of had any interaction with higher education, um, you're outside of that world, whether you'd feel comfortable coming in, whether you'd see the invitation, whether you'd step foot, I think that's a real barrier. Um, so it's not, I think it's not easy day to day on campus for people really to have the interactions will be beneficial. So we've got to work harder, I think, as faculty to think about, well, how do our learning experience, our pedagogy, the exercises we run, the activities we provide help bring people into contact with a wider diversity of, of stakeholders? So my colleague Divya in, in um, Goa has done some fantastic work with students uh, there in terms of getting them out, physically out um, into rural communities and elsewhere to, to work on shared projects. So things which are particular problems and issues within local communities and, and kind of bringing their business mindset, the knowledge they have from their course, the connections they have from their um, their kind of uh, broader professional networks to help in those those circumstances. Um, and that's really beneficial. The, the kind of feedback from, from those students has been, been massively uh, positive in terms of what it's opened their eyes to, both in terms of the challenges that individuals are, are living through, but also the opportunities and actually, I think seeing the opportunities, both in terms of where where you could go for other talent, you know, when they where they go forwards, um, 
and the ingenuity that exists outside of um, maybe the the middle classes or, or, or others that they they typically spend time with, um, but also the the ways of doing things. So people have had to do things because they haven't had resources, and sometimes we can learn a lot from what you have to do um, out of necessity as well. And I think we we see that here um, in the UK a lot as well. I think in terms of um, might be partnering with social enterprises. Um, it might be uh, in terms of kind of business problems. It might be having clinics where um, small businesses, local community groups, charities, and so on can come in with problems or things they need advice on. I think that can be really powerful learning experience for students to you know, apply, whether it's a marketing um, skill they have, doing some insight work, web design stuff, doing a helping somebody put a business plan together. Um, he, would really benefit from it, but doesn't have the expertise um, to hand. Now, that's a really practical way of getting experience with the student and opening their eyes to um, uh, to other problems, to other situations. And then I think kind of on a maybe an easier way to, to do it at scale, um, we can actually just be a bit smarter about the the case studies that we teach, um, the resources we use. Um, so it's still the case that a lot of um, textbooks that might be used within business schools, within other courses, um, are still very Western-centric. Um, the examples which are used are ones that have been used for a long time. So again, they often come from large kind of Western corporates, or it might be research studies that came through from a small number of prestigious universities that had particular demographics of researchers as well. So you're seeing that kind of um, maybe bias within what we teach. And actually, then the issues that are, are deemed important and reflected within the teaching. So we could be much more diverse. We've got a much more diverse student um, body. Well, how do we start to think about the the types of businesses, maybe the types of firm? Actually, it doesn't need to be corporates. Well, how do we reflect more of the informal economy, um, of the micro businesses, of the social entrepreneurs within what we teach? And those are growth areas within management in terms of what people are interested in, where the research goes. Um, and how do we draw on on video cases and others that, that show other people's real lives as well to, to kind of open the eyes up to where you know, maybe the future consumer is coming from um, or the challenges that there's a business opportunity um, in fixing. I think that's where we can be smarter. So it's building in the the day to day. Can we bring more people onto campus, make it a more um, diverse environment um, in all sorts of ways? Can we take the students out and get them into other contexts, really challenge them? Uh, can we bring people in for very specific um, kind of support? And then how do we weave all of this into the curriculum in a way that people are just, it's normal. You see it um, and it doesn't feel strange that you're seeing, um, you know, a, a non-Western context or a very different type of a business. It's just, well, it's part of the variety we always see day to day in our, um, our teaching. Mm. They're good examples. I like the focus on practical examples because anyone who spent any time uh, in the academic world corporate world we can spend a lot of time in our heads dealing with we abstract yep. theories um but we're embodied creatures and i i would say there are there are other ways of of uh, testing the bounds of your knowledge as well um one such way which really um made me realize effectively how useless I am as a human being <laughs> in maternity is when I went to learn some bushcraft. Yeah. Um, I, I went and spent some time in, um, in some ancient English woodland to go and learn how to identify trees um, that I could use for making fires, for setting traps. I learned how to prepare my own food by um, skinning and filleting pheasant and um, and fish and all those things and then building my own shelter and staying outside and you know what it took all day um, to be able to do those things and then the next day I had to start all over again but that nature of being out in the great outdoors for a start and realizing that the world is very complex um, that you are reliant on it for survival that you can see how it all starts to fit together and how you need to fit together with it um you can then appreciate its complexity its beauty whilst at the same time you know you've got no time to sit there thinking about um 
abstractly planning or scheduling, you're in survival mode. It's how is it that I can make sure I keep myself warm? Um, and then you realize that even just the most basic of things, you're quite terrible at. And it takes loads and loads of practice to even do the most simple of things. Um, and that, that extended to when I started to realize I even had a body. So I wasn't even particularly that um, physically um, active until about 13 years ago. Uh, it started off with the usual gym stuff. But the time that I realized that um, God, I really need to figure out problem solving and I'm really not all that capable is when I started doing jujitsu. And there's nothing quite like getting your ass kicked time and time again to realize that you don't know everything <laughs> And that there are there are thing there are some seriously impressive forces out there, um, and even learning on a, ma a manual craft. I mean, I'm terrible. I tried to do it my own camper van and realize just the most basic of joinery skills. Um, I couldn't I couldn't do. And I have a friend who is a bespoke, but you know, he's an artisanal joiner and carpenter. Makes amazing windows and doors, and. I look at what he produces. I look at some of the things produced in the 19th century and before compared to what we produce now in architecture or just the ornate stuff in um, in, in houses uh, compared to what we produce now through the, what I would argue, a kind of business school mentality of utility and productivity. Um, whereas when you're trying to do something to learn it for its own sake, to master an art, to realize the effort that goes into actually doing anything and that you're going to, fluff your lines time and time again and you need to learn from within a tradition and from someone as well you know you can't just figure it out all yourself you need to have someone pass that on to you you know i think all of those different ways they show you the limits of what you know and how you depend on lots of things to just get through the day and so i i think there's i don't know how, how can i summarize that Let's get business students to fight. Let's get them to learn a skill. Let's, uh, yeah, let's go and challenge them in the act. Physically outdoors. challenging them, we're, we're challenging them with, with, yeah, the limitations that they have, putting them out of the comfort zone, giving, getting them to do things where they, they can't complete it on their own. I, I absolutely agree. And I think we see some of that in terms of some of the multidisciplinary uh, project work or, or kind of um, collaborations that, that we have. It's still a little bit of a rarity, but I think... Um, that's that's really powerful and i've seen it work well and we do it on a module systems module that i teach we used to have product design engineers and psychologists and others working together in tasks where they had to had to genuinely work together um and pull kind of disciplinary knowledge and ideas to actually kind of solve um the the tasks that have been set that was a real eye-opener for them and kind of suddenly from sitting side by side in class for a few weeks we're actually understanding that well, there's other people who use different language um, and talk about things differently. Well, actually, it's really valuable. Um, and I, I, you know, it takes effort to work out how we fit together. But I can, we can do something actually when we when we learn how to to make that work. So I agree. I think the practical stuff around how do you how do you do that in a way that doesn't upset upset or um, scare or, or offend people in terms of taking them out of their comfort zone. If we take them to the bushcraft um, or else, we would have to think that through. But I, I absolutely agree. The more we do that kind of really practically shows people you can't do this on your own you know that we need others as you say we need to learn from others experiences as well um but even the bit that says you can't do it solo as well so we're, we're dependent on others i think maybe that's one of the other things that we we don't do enough of is reminding people of the value of society the value of collaboration um and particularly within a work context um and there's all sorts of um research around kind of individual versus collective performance and so on as well um the rages but i think getting people to value being a part of a team rather than being the leader um and of being part of the solution as opposed to the person who came up with the final uh, product or what have you i think again maybe that's a push back on us as educators to think a bit more around how we think about that as a mindset as well and the humility and the satisfaction that comes from being a part of that collective effort um, rather than being the one who's getting the credit or kind of top of the top of the pile. Mm, agreed. We spoke a bit about social license earlier. What topics do you think uh, are most likely to be um, uh, challenged in future, uh, and that you think epistemic humility could remedy? Uh, so I think the the ones most probably most topical, I think, um, will be AI, and I think just the 
the awareness it feels like it, that's growing now i think in wider society of, of the need to have guardrails around this and questioning i guess the legitimacy of of the technology and how far it goes how it's applied i think it's really interesting so i think we're living through that a bit like with the internet i guess although um at greater even greater pace i think um around the, the negotiation of what what's acceptable so we're kind of living through that kind of establishing that that kind of um that license to operate at the moment um and starting to put that in place so i think that's probably going to be the most interesting one and i think again probably where as an industry we talk about hubris and we talk about overconfidence um and maybe a lack of humility then i think you, you could probably quite fairly say that um tech is is maybe the forerunner of that at the moment or most prominent um I think the assumption that you can design and engineer, engineer your way out of pretty much any problem. I think we, I think you, you can see where that comes up against its limitations, can't you? Think about Zuckerberg and Facebook and, um, and that recognition that actually it's important what people think about how a product is used and, and so on. It's not just an engineering thing. I was reading about Nick Clegg, um, uh, I think it was in the FT or, or, or um, The Economist the, the other day, and talking about his role at, at Meta, um, and actually quite how influential that that is, I think. But the journey for the company of realizing they need to needed to really take that public relations and the governance side seriously, um, I think when it, you know, I think that's really interesting. That that kind of showed when they recognised that that limitation, what they could do on their own, um, and where actually the dependencies with governments with society um, really started to bite. Um, and the risks actually have not taken that seriously. So I think that's quite a nice, um, quite a nice example there. But with AI, I think we're just going to see this time and time again around, well, what's possible, what the technical um, fixes might be, but actually those maybe not being enough to satisfy the concerns that people have that may not be viewed as rational, but are important and are deeply held. Um, and those kind of, those kind of interactions. Mm, yeah, I think there are so many layers to the AI onion. I was speaking with a a well-being consultant a couple of weeks ago and um he made a distinction between the companies who are going to focus on human performance which i would probably change a little bit which is just human centered instead of human performance one that isn't focused on the other side of the coin which is utility productivity how can we use ai just to get rid of our workshop the workforce and use lots of generative ai stuff mm -hmm. But, you know, th those companies will definitely have their social license challenged, I would say. The ones who do the former, which is how do we use it to free up the humans to do other stuff um, and to do worthwhile stuff would be good. Um, I, w one thing that I think might be an indirect damage to social license will be companies that don't get on top of their employees who use chat gpt and the like to produce their work and what i mean by that is i see one of the biggest risks to this is the the dehumanizing of us and, and what i mean by that is you know we are uh, creative creatures it can come from the soul often and the very nature of engaging in creative work to produce things whether it's in a business environment or not it can be hard it can be time consuming it can require lots of procrastination there can be doses of inspiration, there can be sporadic bouts of production, and then there can be long drawn out processes, but you are forever changed by doing it, no matter how big or small, it's an act of creation. And what I see, and I refuse to engage in chat GPT and to get it to help me with anything, because I know that what that is going to do is it is going to de-skill me in some way, and not just de-skill me, but it's going to rob me of something. And And, and because I think I think because ChatGPT kind of feeds on itself um, is I think we're going to um, potentially see lots of poor output. And I think that anyone, if there's any business school people listening, if you want to put yourself really in the top 1%, if that's what you care about um, or not, if you just want to be good at what you do, I do think trying to hone and craft a skill and doing it on your own uh, will stand you in better stead than everyone else who's producing their PowerPoint slides using ChatGPT. You look like you're going to disagree with that, Matt, so go for it. Well, I, not, not that I disagree, but it, in, in entirety, so I think for me, it illustrates the, um, 
the implications of decisions that people make around this. So how do we implement AI? What's the purpose of bringing this into a business? We might well talk about allocation of functions. So think about maybe what we decide a machine is going to do versus a human. And we could say we could go for that productivity approach and say we're going to try and replace all that we can do um, that we we see AI um, as being quicker, more efficient, less error prone um, than humans. Um, no, maybe we just leave the stuff that's too hard or too um, too expensive to automate. We leave that with with humans, regardless of what that means. The experience is like to do that job that might be either hugely repetitive or maybe so complex, maybe so challenging that it's a really stressful, really kind of difficult role to perform versus alternatives, which might be saying, well, actually, we're going to live with a bit of redundancy to allow people to Know, do a, a broader job where they use um, maybe AI, ChatGPT, GPT, whatever it might be, as a tool as part of this. Um, but they keep the enjoyment because they have a wider role. They choose where they put their time. It's a kind of, but it's less efficient. But we have a more engaged, a broader base kind of um, workforce who actually understand what it is they're doing, um, and that gives us value in you know whatever those ways might be as well. So I think there's decisions over that kind of how do we integrate in terms of the work system. Um, but I think it's also in terms of for, for us, the implications of using chat GPT. I think you, you know, there's all the lots written around this isn't there in terms of the history of uh, technological uh, innovation when we have big technology leaps um, in the past. And I always take heart in the fact that we haven't had a, a new great technology come in that hasn't led to more job creation. Um, and I think, uh, that's that's where I'm coming from. This is my view of it is the, of AI. So it's another tool, um, and we can choose whether we let that rule us and um, we obsess over the maybe some of the the tasks and the roles that it maybe replaces. It, again, the classic example: people don't mourn the loss of the person with the red flag walking in front of a a car that's uh, that's no longer needed, or, or what have you, or the people who used to to shovel the the horse shit um, from the the horse drawn carriages as as a job. Um, but we create new ones, and it might be that actually, if we're able to automate some of the routine jobs, maybe jobs which are um, maybe actually kind of harmful for, for people to do over time, um, or just not enjoyable, then that's not necessarily a bad thing. If it means that we can put those people to either more interesting use, or they, you know, all sorts of jobs that might grow up on the back of it, um, but also. Thinking about it as a tool, you mentioned the unreliability of, of um, AI and it feeds on itself and got the biases that come in. Again, thinking about epistemic humility, being wise to the fact that it's our knowledge that's going in and programming this and it's our worldview that's being reflected. Um, so actually, it'd be really good to expose ourselves to maybe um, some more contrasting views and experiences um, because we're probably not getting it right. But I think for me, then, that that's illustrating the fact that the human's still really important here to be able to do that that kind of reflection, the critical thought. Um, and there's a role for that reflection that may not be efficient. People are, are using the tool. You have another step in the process, um, but there's value there for, for the interpretation that it brings. Um, so uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably more optimistic. I think I would see it, and I, I think about my own job in terms of where where would I start to use ChatGPT. And it's not good enough at the moment, but I think it could in, in, in time be a really good Starting point, if you're doing a big literature review, how do I make sure that I'm not just going back to the, the sources and the information that I know? Actually, AI that has a, you know, the, the capabilities to go much broader, that could do my, my first pass literature review, help me kind of find things I hadn't seen before. Um, and it's just another step on from the kind of um, Google Scholar web searching tools we use already at the moment um, to find knowledge. But actually, maybe that could be something that actually exposes me to, to more sources of information, different sources of information that I otherwise would have seen. And then I can make use of that and do the creative part and the, the application of knowledge. But I'd say it's a tool that would help me go much further, much broader than I could do otherwise. So anyway, that's a ramble of, of uh, <laughs> we've gone off topic, but uh, I mean, AI is, is, is fascinating, isn't it? Because it, it touches on all of these issues. Well, I, I'd say I'd say we stayed on topic insofar as we're talking about business schools. And I think AI is something that anyone coming out of a business school and into corporations, they're going to come across. They're likely going to promote it as something that they think firms should um, 
uh, integrate within what they do and they'll probably use it themselves so i i think we could we can give ourselves a pass <laughs> for that little for that little ramble um I, I think there's probably going to be some social license uh, challenging around um, those who end up in the field of sustainability, um, particularly because, you know, you generally will find uh, industry bodies grouping together and alliances grouping together to come up with ways in which to um, govern society towards what they deem to be a more sustainable world. And, um and, and I think a lot of them are focusing on things like nudge theory, technocratic stuff. Now we're starting to talk about how is it that we can potentially do some kind of human engineering to change diets. And I, I, I think there is a, a distress. If I can get my finger on the pulse, I'd say that there is a outside of those circles, there's a growing distrust or mistrust of those organizations who are starting to suggest more draconian measures to get on top of whatever crises that are that they've, they've set themselves up to manage. So I think um, I think for those ending up in that field, um, I think over being overly technocratic or overly focused on nudge theory, I think that's likely to get some strong pushback. I agree, but also I think in terms of so we think about sustainability, actually deciding on what the what the key metric or the key issue is that you're you're looking to address. I think is there another area where this openness to others' experiences, views, priorities, being interested in finding those out um, is really important there as well. My, my colleague, Mark Sumner, who's, who's here at Leeds, we've done a lot of work around fashion supply chains and so on together. Um, and he always reminds me of the, the point that for, for buyers and others, for, for international brands, they have to juggle these huge number of competing sustainability goals that they've been Everybody's saying is equally important. So consumers are screaming for particular things, politicians for others. And, but depending on what we prioritize in terms of who we buy from their credentials or, or the types of maybe raw materials we're using, there might be lower carbon impact, there might be lower water usage, maybe kind of longer actual kind of um, uh, durability that has benefit. Each of those comes with trade-offs. And I think being able to understand the implications of those, maybe come back to the local community issue, is think about, well, again, who, who we call in the local community. Um, so is it in terms of where the, the product is sold into, where the consumer is, where the, uh, the business is headquartered? Is it in terms of each of the suppliers, maybe, or where the manufacturer is taking place? Who are we thinking about in terms of being impacted? Um, because I think all these things come in also kind of play into the social license of which community and which stakeholder. Um, and just being really aware of the fact that actually kind of your, your workforce might have a very different tolerance around what they're willing to put up with because you're giving them employment versus the local community outside the factory gate who's being subjected to the, the pollution potentially, um, or the people who are where the end product ends up in landfill wants to be shipped halfway around the world from the end consumer. And so I think it's, re it's really interesting, I think, particularly with sustainability, thinking some of that through. But again, I, th I think that's a really cool um, example of where this need to have people who are willing to challenge open to that kind of um, diversity of view is, is so important. Hey, that's uh, the, the famous line from the great American economist, Thomas Sowell, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. Mm. And for those who end up focusing on sustainability can often be from that, um, that viewpoint that there is a solution to be found and if we just roll that out that will be the answer to our problems we can focus on this metric co2 and abracadabra everything gets fixed but within that the, the impacts on the real world based on just trying to make a move on that metric you know you can end up with a, a very bad uh, world with less co2 in it so uh, i like the talk about trade-offs matt we're closing on the end zone so we'll go with the last question. If you could advise a, a CEO for one day on how to foster epistemic humility within that organization, what would you tell them to do? Mm. Yeah, good question. Ooh, where to start? I think the biggest thing would be um, getting people out of their office, their comfort zone, their circle, their group, their clique, whatever it might be. So I think spend, seriously spending time on thinking, how do we get our organization as a whole to engage outside 
So that's not thinking about the people who have got it in their job role or thinking about the old volunteering day um, or who does the market research, but how do we make sure that we're properly embedded and engaged with our local community, with others around us? And that's where you're going to start to, um, I think, come into contact with these other experiences, breaking out of this. Um, and I think for, for CEOs themselves and others, um, that point you made around really, really challenging yourself um, and taking yourself out of your comfort zone, I think that's something that we can all benefit from. I think particularly if you spend most of your life having people be pretty deferential to you, um, if you succeed as you move to the top, that the, the, the confidence builds quite rightly because you're very successful in your, your particular area. So I think you, you have to recognize the fact that you need to be taken down a peg or two occasionally and maybe be the one who engineers the opportunity for that to happen. And that may be comfortable and look different for different people. Um, but I think it's, it's seeking that out um, and not just in a way that kind of challenges you in terms of pushing your, your goals or kind of, it's not that side of it. It's really taking you outside um, of your comfort zone and showing you, you know, that you can't do things, that you're dependent on others, all the things that you said. Um, but you've got to be quite brave, I think, to, um, to put yourself in that position. Absolutely. Well, on that creed occur, we'll call it a day, Matt. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you. And I look forward to chatting again in the future. I'll be keeping an eye out for more interesting papers. Thanks so much, John. Enjoyed it. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Thank you for joining me in Thinking Class today. To keep up to date with all that I am doing, please subscribe to the Thinking Class YouTube channel at Thinking Class and follow me on X at Thinking Classes. Thinking Class seeks to understand the civilizational issues we face and why what our leaders do in response matters. Here, I seek to explore the ideas, values, and culture that made our civilization, those that are unmaking it, and how leaders at our public and private institutions should respond. Engage with me on YouTube or X, or write to me at thinkingclasspod at gmail.com to tell me who you want me to speak to and what topics are important to you. I look forward to seeing you there and for joining me on this journey.